We're in the middle of this sermon series called The Movement. We're reading the book of Acts together and learning how the church began. This week we learned in Vacation Bibles about the, the power of God to, to do hard things, to give us hope, uh, to help us be bold, to have everlasting life, and to, to be good friends. So this morning we're in Acts chapter 12. If you want to follow along, we'll be reading through it in just a moment. We're in Acts chapter 12. It's the story of how God's power broke St. Peter out of jail. Now for me, uh, the idea of jail was introduced to me in the, the board game Monopoly, right? There's a little jail in the corner and you had that go to jail, and then you got the awesome like get out of jail free card. But jail became personal for me when I actually had to visit a prison. And even more personal when at Mount Olive we had a group of us that went to the juvenile detention center out in Plainfield, and we regularly visited a house of 10 to 14 year old boys in the dormitory. And all of a sudden, prison became different. Took pizza, sang some songs with a guitar, uh, told a devotion, and then just watched the eyes of these kids uh, singing Christmas carols especially. I'll never forget that. Just, and realized that these are kids that had been before a judge you know, three to five times before they ended up there. Here in this place, we have a Kairos prison ministry, people that have gone into prison and, and done sort of a weekend to try and inspire inmates here. And, I don't know if any of you have been part of that, or made cookies, a bunch of us made cookies, or we pray through the week. Have you been part of that? Can I raise your... there, there are people that have been a part of reaching out to those who are incarcerated. For me, this idea of being involved with people in jail leads us to the story today of imagining Peter in prison, and then the story of God and, and the jailbreak. And again, her jailbreak in my brain went to you know, Steve McQueen, the Great Escape, uh, or a Cool Hand Luke, Paul Newman, uh, or Clint Eastwood and Escape from Alcatraz, or the ultimate one for my personal favorite is uh, Morgan Freeman in The Shawshank Redemption. So these movies of, of jailbreaks, they're great stories. But all of those really get back to this story for me in the chapter 12 of the book of Acts. So let me first of all take a step back and remind you the big picture of what's going on in the early church. Because we tend to look at the early church with kind of rose-colored glasses. But just like today, uh, the movement and, and, and being Christian is messy and challenging because we still live in this messy, sinful world. And as long as sin is in the world, the movement, the church, is going to face opposition. We walk through the story a little bit. There was opposition from within. We have the story of Ananias and Sapphira. There's an internal dispute about being fair and, and equal to each other in, in the distribution of food that led to the establishment of seven more elders. And then there's opposition from the religious establishment, where in the name of religion, the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem aggressively set out to destroy the church. A couple weeks ago, they, they stoned Stephen. And then they send out this bulldog named Saul to, to arrest and throw Christians into jail to try and thwart the movement. And again, it's that go to jail, do not pass go, do not collect $200, that, that, that sense of people locked away. Today we add, there's opposition from politicians and, and governments. We all remember it was the, the Roman government that had Jesus executed. But here in chapter 12 is the story of the King Herod Agrippa, who sets out to arrest and then execute the leadership of the movement, the disciples. And being arrested by governments and thrown into jail, it's actually a constant reality for people who follow Jesus throughout history. There, there are still persecuted Christians in the world today who are being arrested for their faith in Jesus. In fact, the book of Acts is going to end with Paul in jail. Throughout history, people continue to be completely uh, devoid of understanding the point, what the movement is really all about. Following Jesus is not giving up my freedom. It's not being imprisoned by some rules or rituals. It's actually this incredible love of God story, where God says, I'm actually at work to free you, to free you from sin and death and the power of the devil. Jesus actually came to get us out of jail, to free us from the prison of sin that, that wants to, to keep us in. Jesus actually came to give us a get-out-of-jail-free card. And so we read in the book of Acts, 
that with each opposition, God finds a way to do something dramatic, to speak into the story and say, I'm still God, I'm leading this movement, and in some dramatic way, he finds a way to intercede with the church and keep the movement going. So today, he dramatically intercedes in the life of Peter and in this moment of crisis in the church. Here's the point. Until the end of time, sin will always make things messy. Until the end of time, things are not perfect. And growing the movement, being Christian, being the church, will always face opposition. But through it all, we see God at work. God at work in the church proclaiming the gospel. We see God freeing people from prisons caused by sin. So last week was the conversion of Saul. As God had to intervene in the life of the church to make sure that they got this idea that their purpose was to reach the world. Not just stay among the Jewish people in Jerusalem, but literally take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And in dramatic fashion, God turned around his greatest opponent and made him his greatest advocate. Saul, we said last week, becomes Paul. And if Saul can be converted, anyone can be saved. And then Paul is called literally to be the, the one who takes the gospel to the Gentiles, to shift the movement from not just around the Jewish synagogues and Jewish people, but now let's take the gospel to the ends of the earth. Finally, God is intervening and doing what had to be done all along. He said, you're supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah wrote it in chapter 49, verse 6. The Lord says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. It's too small a thing. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. That's Isaiah. Still hasn't happened yet. So God intervenes when, when Jesus has come and the, the plan is accomplished and sins are forgiven and death is destroyed. He still has to take these people and say, we need to push you outside your little comfortable bounds to reach the world. So chapter 12 really marks a transition in the story of the movement from, from Peter at the center of the story to Paul. It's the last real story we hear about Peter. In chapter 11, God had revealed to Peter that the movement was also for the Gentiles. He has this revelation and story, and he witnesses and Gentile people speak in tongues. They have the same movement that they did at the beginning. So if God can work in them, maybe God is doing something bigger than I thought. So in chapter 11, verse 18, it says this. When they heard this testimony of Peter's vision, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, So then, even to the Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. The movement of St. Peter and the gospel of Jerusalem has come to this place where you finally realize that the gospel is here, the story is here. Now it's time to finally do God's plan and reach to the ends of the earth. But in chapter 12, as we said, the opposition of the movement now becomes religious. And now it becomes political. It starts off, King Herod Agrippa has John, James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, has him arrested and beheaded. That's how this chapter opens. And the death of James shattered this illusion that somehow the 12 disciples enjoyed some kind of divine protection. Somehow they were on this elevate. God would not let anything happen to them. Sort of destroys that idea. And we look at governments and politics. When polls and popularity and creating positive public perception and keeping power drive political decision making, we witness the corruption of morals and principles. Money and maintaining power become the driving force of governments. Decisions become unwise, unfair, unjust, and often cruel. We still see that today. If you think about it, it, it was literally a lose-lose moment for the church. Herod was making a calculated political move. As long as everything was okay between him and the Jewish leaders, they would keep the peace. So he was going to help to squash this Christian movement and let them stay in power. The Jewish leaders were doing everything they possibly could to shut down the movement. So Herod's next move, 
Kill James, he's going to cut off the head. I'll take out the leader. I'll take out Peter. So he has Peter arrested and assigned to this sort of high security detail to guard Peter. He has four squads of four soldiers. Because he knows that Peter and the other apostles have mysteriously escaped from prison before. So extraordinary precautions are taken this time. He's not just chained to one soldier, he's chained to two. And there's two outside the door to make sure nobody breaks in and steals this guy out. Now just imagine for a moment, we're the only church. And this is a devastating and, and scary you know, chain of events. Peter's the one who's recognized as the leader in Jerusalem. He's also, to many of them, sort of their, their, their friend, the one who inspired them to believe. And, and if James is dead and now Peter is dead, what's to become of the movement? What's to become of us? And so into that crisis moment, God intercedes. But how do people respond? It says they, they gathered together and they prayed. In crisis moments, we, we turn to God. I vividly remember the days following 9-11. Do you? It's probably in the history of my being a pastor, the most spiritual, prayerful time in the life of the church. People wanted to be in church. They wanted to pray. They wanted to be together. Families and small groups, we all sort of gathered to pray. It was a moment of crisis. And you can think of times when you desperately found yourself Praying with your heart wide open in the presence of God. When I wrote that, the first thought that came to my mind happened over 30 years ago. But I have this vivid memory still. Joanne, it was uncomfortable and cramping and, and things weren't going right, so I left an elders meeting. I actually went home that night. We made it through the night. Uh, and we knew something was going on. Uh, we thought maybe it was you know, cancer, or who didn't know, or she had been pregnant. We and so we get to the doctor first thing in the morning. Um, luckily, they took her in. We went to the doctor's office, and within minutes, uh, I've got the doctor coming in my face, and Joanne's going by ambulance from there to the hospital. It was an ectopic pregnancy. They're starting to rupture, and we have to take care of this so they could both be dead. So I found out in a moment that I was having a child and that my wife could die. So you sign the papers and you rush to the hospital and you sit. I remember that day by myself in a hospital praying. You had those moments? You're just like desperately, God, you have to find a way to show up. Kind of felt the same way when my son at 15 years old had open heart surgery. You know that feeling? There's a group of people in a room praying like that because it feels like the movement's coming to an end. It's all about to unravel. James is dead. Peter's going to be dead tomorrow. There's going to be a public sham of a trial, and they're going to execute him too. And Peter, he's in jail, waiting this trial and execution the next day. He's still chained to two guards. But an angel comes to him in jail. We're in verse 8 of chapter 12. The angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison. He had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and then the second guard and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself automatically, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of the street, suddenly the angel left him. Just a quick question. What's your iron gate? You know, the, the final barrier that keeps you from being free. What's that thing that you, you worry about? Am I ever going to get through that? issue, that place, that moment, that iron gate. You know what I'm talking about. It's the next big decision. It's work performance and job cuts. It's will my kid get a good job after college. It's the looming deadline. Will I make the team? Will I get to play? Will I get the promotion? Can I pay that bill? 
There's always something in our life that seems to be a barrier, some iron gate that, that's holding me back. When, when this happens, then, then I'll be on fire for God. When I can get to this point in my life, then I'll be a witness. Then I'll join the movement. So you find yourself anxious and worried about whatever that iron gate is. This story says, it's kind of good to know that when I face the iron gate, I have a God who goes before me and a guy who says, I will be with you to walk through that gate. It says next that Peter goes through the iron gate, walks down the street. And then he said to himself, the angel leaves, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. He comes to the senses and realizes he's actually free. And so he naturally says, I'm going to find a group of Christians. I know where they're praying. And so he goes to the house. And then I kind of love the humorous part of the story. In the middle there's this girl named Rhoda. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of fun. This crazy moment is happening, right? It's this tragic moment. And in the middle of all that, there's a story about this little girl standing at the door. Two things happen. It kind of lends credibility to the actual eyewitness account of the story that they put her name in there, tell her story. But it also reminds us, in the midst of this huge dramatic moment, this crisis in the church, this little girl whose name's in the Bible. Like, her story mattered. That a part of the story is the little girl who opened the door for Peter in the middle of the story. That your story matters. That, that the way you impact the life of the big story, it may be the church, the big crisis, but God says, I still know your name. I still know you. You are still a part of this big story. So instead of Rona, put your name in that place. As it ended last week, I said, what will be the headline to your story? So Rhoda hears Peter's voice outside the door. She's so excited, she doesn't even open the door. She runs and she says, Peter's at the door! Can you imagine? And their reaction was, you're out of your mind. You're just a kid, what do you know? Isn't it interesting when God's sometimes doing really cool things, we say, ah, oh, you've got to be kidding. God wouldn't do that, would he? Could he? They prayed, but did they really expect God to do anything? When you pray, do you expect God to show up? Because God answered. He answered their prayer, and he breaks Peter out of jail. The next part of the story, he says, can you imagine King Herod and his guards the next morning? Can you imagine political crisis happening when you get egg on your face? No politician wants egg on their face. Right? He now looks like a fool. He arrested the guy to put an end. He thought he was at the crisis of the peak of destroying the movement and gaining power with the Jewish. Instead, what happens? In the morning, there was no small commotion, verse 18, among the soldiers as to what had happened and what had become of Peter. After Herod had thoroughly made a thorough search for him and did not find him, he cross-examined the guards and he ordered that they be executed. Herod's furious. Have you ever witnessed political power or people in power doing irrational things in a moment when they're angry? But just so you know, things don't end well for Herod. You know, he's one of those guys, he loved to be loved, don't we all? But he really sort of enjoyed this whole thing, kind of went to his head. Not unlike certain politicians of our day. But I love it's the story that says, uh, he goes then the following story. There's tension with the cities of Tyre and Sidon. Uh, they sort of had this break. So they came to him and they asked for peace because they depended on Herod for their food supply. So verse 21. On the appointed day, Herod wearing his royal robes. Now, uh, in the Josephus, it says that this robe was all pure silver. So when he walked into the light, he glistened. Like the sun shone on him in the morning and <laughs> he's like sparkly with, you know, He sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people, and they all shouted, This is the voice of a God, not a man. And then God reminds him who really is God. Uh, Herod has an upset stomach. Actually, it says he gets eaten by worms and dies. 
you think about the story, it's a rather interesting flip, a remarkable reversal of, of tide. The story is switched by God. In the beginning, James is dead, Peter's in prison, Herod's triumphant. At the end, Herod is dead, Peter is free, and the movement is triumphant. So I have one final question for today. What has you imprisoned these days? What has you tied up in knots? An addiction, anger, anxiety? Maybe it's a broken relationship, or feelings of inadequacy, or loneliness. What has your guts tied up these days? Where it feels like your heart, your soul are sort of locked away in a prison. Because the story all week has been about the power of God. That, that Jesus gives us power to face sin and death and the devil with boldness. To say God's got this and God is with me. In the midst of the story, it will be messy, it won't be easy. There's ups and downs in the life of my life and the life of the church. But, but there's this story of God at work. He's got this and he's got me and I can trust him in my life. So how about you? How is God pushing you these days? In the early church, it was a crisis point. Were they just going to stay among the Jews? Or were they going to actually finally reach to the whole world? He calls Paul to lead the movement. And he says to the church, look, I've got this. No political power is going to stop this. No church religious power is going to stop this. The story of the gospel is going to continue to be spread. And now that story is continuing to be spread through you and through me. And there will be days where we're going to have to stand up and say what we believe. And, and literally live like our, our, our life depended on it. To say what God says. To love who God loves. To go where God sends you. God rescued Peter because he wasn't done with him yet. The mission had to continue through this guy named Peter. And you're still here. Because your mission is not complete yet. There are people stuck in all kinds of prisons. And you know them. There are probably times in your life when it felt like that was you, stuck in a prison. But Jesus gives us a limitless supply of get out of free jail cards. Get out of jail free cards. And he says, give them away. It's not like a board game, it's like life. Literally, like, give them the card. That there is forgiveness and there is grace and there's a love of God. You do not have to remain the rest of your days locked in this prison. The reality of hell, heaven is yours. And the reality that heaven living out that today is a part of who we are as the church on earth. You have a limitless supply of get out of jail free cards. That's the mission. It didn't stop with Peter. It, it didn't stop throughout the history of the church. It didn't stop with people being locked up in jail. It didn't stop with persecuted Christians in the world. It doesn't stop because the same God that rescued Peter is the very same God who rescued you. So what's holding you back? What's the iron door that's keeping you from going on mission, from being who you are, from being the church in the world around us? So the world will see there is a God who sent his son to free us, to forgive sins, to let us live with confidence and boldness and hope, doing it with friends who hang on to each other because we, we love Jesus and we do it together. Where this communion meal is not just a, a moment, it's the presence of Jesus in this place and inside of us. And the presence of Jesus goes with us to set people free. Chapter 12 is not just the story of Peter. It's your story. It's my story. I'm not imprisoned by sin. You are not Imprisoned by sin. Jesus breaks you free. Amen? Will you stand with me, please?
There's God and the Father in heaven. When we think of jail, we think of prisoners incarcerated in some place. We're reminded today that sin finds its way to imprison all of us. And we get stuck in sin. We get stuck in sinful patterns. We get stuck in feelings of guilt and shame. We get stuck on a path away from you, a path that leads to death. But you sent Jesus into the world to free us from that path, to save us from sin, to set us free from those sins, to free us from guilt and shame. So we can live boldly because we know that you love us. We can live in the face of whatever life throws at us. Because we got the Spirit of God alive and living in us. We can face whatever iron gates we are afraid of and we're worried about, knowing that God, you will be with us. Whatever the outcome. Jesus, we thank you for coming into this messy world and offering us hope and life and, and victory and setting us free. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah.